Corn School is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Bernard Tobin here for the Corn School. I'm joined by uh, Shannon Osborne. Uh, she is an agronomist, a researcher, uh, USDA, um, South Dakota. Hey, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Now, a lot of your research is on soil organic matter. And uh, it's always an interesting conversation about organic matter, especially when you're removing, you know, um, corn stalks, or residual, or residue. Um, and the question is, how much should we remove? Uh, how much, you know, should we take off the field, especially when there's demand, you know, for cellulose, ethanol, that type of thing. Shannon, you've done a lot of research recently uh, on, you know, removal rates. Uh, what have you found out? So we've been doing research for probably since 2000, so about 17 years, and it was a group effort with a number of different researchers within um, the Corn Belt within um, the United States. And so what we did was we looked at how much residue can we remove while still maintaining soil organic carbon, because the residue, as you know, is not waste. It is very important for the soil, for the organisms that live in the soil, and just to maintain our, our soil health. And so what we did was we looked at three different residue removals. Um, one was just removing the grain, just like you would normally do. The second was a medium residue removal, which we went in, we harvested the grain, came back and chopped the stalks, baled them and removed them, like you would do for bedding for livestock or feed. And then the third was utilizing a silage chopper. And so if you were gonna take silage for cattle production, it would remove all of the residue. So those were the three different residue mm -hmm. removals that we looked at. And over the long term, what we found that um, removing residue has a very negative impact on several soil um, chemical, biological, and physical properties. Mm -hmm. And so what we did, that experiment, as I said, was started in 2000. And in 2005, we really was starting to look at cover crops and how cover crops can be utilized to bring more carbon back to the system. And so we took the plots and we split them half with the cover crop and half without a cover crop. And so what we found was that by adding a cover crop when you're removing that residue, is you can really help reduce mm -hmm. the negative impact. Right. And the reason for that is simply you're keeping the soil covered, you have more biomass, living roots that are there for the soil um, organisms. And so it doesn't totally get it back up to not removing the residue at all, but it's kind of a happy medium if in your production system you need to remove that residue because you have cattle, because it's another income yeah. stream. So it really helps make the best of that type of situation. From your research, is there a sense of how much removal is too much, uh, you know, when it comes, you know, uh, you know, corn silage after corn silage, for example? Right. And so um, the research that we did that was collaborative with all of the regions, there was, um, what we found was if you have a yield that is below about 170 bushels mm. per acre, removing residue is gonna have a negative impact on soil carbon. If your yields are above that um, 170 bushels per acre, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be, you know, you're, you're not gonna have too much of a negative right. impact. And so that was kind of the regional research that we did. Um, but at our specific location, um, it was, any type of removal, because our yields were about that 150, any type of removal had a negative impact, and that cover crop would help put us back at kind of a baseline. Right. Hey, final question for you, and that is in establishing that cover crop. Interseeding, you've done a lot of research on you know what, how, what works best in corn, uh, after corn. Um, what can you tell us? So the experiment itself was in a corn-soybean rotation. So. You know, cover crops are kind of a natural fit after a small grain or a cool season because you have this window to plant it. But when you're in a corn soybean rotation, you don't have that ability to do that. So we looked at a number of different things, anything from aerial seeding the cover crop to um, broadcasting it um, by hand or on a high boy behind a gandy, you know, with a gandy spreader on a high boy. But what we really found was when you put that seed on the soil surface, you're leaving it to the exposure of the elements. Will you get a rainfall? Um, are there critters that are mm. there in the soil that are going to eat those cover crop seeds? So it was really kind of a 50-50 with what we got right. um, for establishment. 
So we also looked at what would be the impact of planting an earlier maturing soybean or an earlier maturing corn and then removing it and drilling the cover crop in so you got good seed yep. to soil contact. And um, the last few years of the experiment, we started looking at interseeding. Right. And um, interseeding really seems to be a good way to do it, but you have to be very careful in the cover crops that you choose right. and the planting, the seeding rate that you choose right. for those cover crops so that it doesn't impact the crop itself or impact harvesting. Mm. Um, final tip, uh, what worked best, cereal or rye or what? Um, you know, I really am a fan of mixtures. I really like mixtures of cover crop because I really think it's about diversity. Mm. And so cover crop is a way to add diversity back to the yep. system. And so add that diversity in your cover crop and then that will add that diversity into your mm. system. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for dropping by. Um, great to have you up in Canada and uh, we'll see you in the Dakotas one day soon. Sounds great. Thanks.